Good morning, Southside. <clears throat> Special welcome to any guests that are with us this morning. We are always grateful to have you. I have a special guest, a young lady who helped us start this church many, many years ago and was a big player in our young disciples, and she's been battling cystic fibrosis her whole life in a God-honoring way with a great hope of glory. And so Abby Gordon is back with us this morning. We are glad to have her. She lives in Carolina, and she's enjoying the Rockies again. This is her favorite place on earth. Wanted to fill you in on the memorial service for little Chloe Dickens. Uh, Such a blessing. Uh, Christ was honored and glorified, and um, it was just a a sweet time to gather and remember our blessed hope, and just grateful for all the volunteers and the deacons and the body just all coming together to work for this family for the glory of Christ, and the family was very, very grateful. So thank you all for your help with that. This morning, we're going to take back up in our study through Philippians. If you'll turn to Philippians chapter 1, this is one of Paul's prison epistles. He's writing this from a a Roman prison. Uh, With much for us to learn from this letter, I think it's one of the richer letters I've studied in my journey to glory. So I'm blessed this morning to start digging in now to the body of this letter. And I'm going to read verses 3 through 8, and then we will pray and ask God's blessing over his word. Verse 3, I thank my God and all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we come now and we desire to continue our worship. We want to worship you through these words that you have inspired through your Holy Spirit so that we have the the perfect and errant word of God. We have your mind and your thoughts being communicated to us. Let no one hold that lightly this morning that the creator of the universe will speak through his word. God, let us come with reverence and great joy uh, in these words. God, would you meet us Abba, Father, in a very special way as we open them up. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, just kind of a review from last week as we opened it up. Paul began this epistle wanting to kind of give us these three distinctives of being a child of God, a Christian. And the first distinctive identity for being a Christian is that we're bond slaves. We are these willing slaves now. Our hearts have been taken up with Christ. And the most joyful labor that we have now is to come under him and be subservient and serve the king of kings. And then secondly, you're all saints. Everyone who's come to faith has now been set apart for God, for his use, for his glory. We are the holy ones set apart, consecrated to God. And then thirdly, we're the children of God. I don't know of a greater identity than sons and daughters of God. And then we looked at this distinctive reality of being a Christian, that you are in Christ, the fount of every blessing. You have been joined to him, and all the blessings flow in, from, and through Christ. So we are now in union with the second person of the Trinity by his Spirit. And then thirdly, we looked at the distinctive experience of being a Christian grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we now, we begin this letter standing in grace and the full acceptance of God and his favor and his power toward us as we begin to embark now to live the way Paul is going to call us in this letter. And we, we stand in peace. We have peace with God and peace in our hearts and peace with one another. So now let's embark upon this letter with that foundation. Paul is now going to turn his letter very personal. We're going to get to see his heart. He's going to unfold it to this church here in Philippi. 
And as he does, there's just so much for us to learn this morning from this section of Scripture. The application has been rich in my own heart, and I'm praying and asking God to take it deeper into every heart that we walk out of here with what Paul is writing to the church in Philippi. So at first, what I'd like to do is kind of give you an overview of this chapter as we dive in. And the focus of this chapter, I like that title by Kent Hughes. I'm going to call it the same. It's the fellowship of the gospel. This is the the fellowship of the rings. We have the, the fellowship together of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is going to run through this letter. The deep unity that, that it brings to the body of Christ by having the fellowship of the gospel. And so how entering into all that we do is this gospel. So I want you to see the outline. And the outline in verses 3 through 8 that we're going to follow is, is Paul's going to say, put the fellowship of the gospel at the center of our relations with one another. So at the very center of all of our relationships in this body, what is to be central is to be the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then in verses 9 through 11, he's going to say, put the priorities of the gospel at the center of your prayer life. So as we enter into prayer, the, the, the center of what we're praying for is going to be the gospel. And then in verses 12 through 18, he's going to say, put the advance of the gospel at the center of your aspirations, that all of us come together and we want the gospel to advance. It's, it's, it's the desire of our heart, whether I live or die, I want the gospel to go forth. And then in verses 19 through 26, Paul's going to say, put the gospel, uh, the converts of the gospel at the center of your principled self-denial. And we'll see Paul denying himself for the good of the Philippian church. So as we begin this chapter, so much has been jumping out, is the true fellowship of the gospel is why we're still here on this earth. This is the great commission. This is the mandate that Jesus has left for his bride. And this gospel is what sanctifies us. And and going into this mission, this commission sanctifies us, and it's what unifies us. It's what, it, what takes our heart up over every other occupation in the land. Everything is under this one end, this one goal, this one purpose. And if you, if you haven't gotten this, you haven't gotten the gospel. When the gospel gets in, this is what happens to a heart. So it's my prayer that the Holy Spirit will work in each one of our hearts during this passage of Scripture that we would all be taken up as one in the proclaiming and the growing in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that nothing could break our unity and our pursuit and our focus on this gospel. I want to pull a Luther. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, the gospel. Make that spirit reign in every heart at Southside Bible Church to open your heart up, Prepare for the scalpel and let the flesh of laziness and selfishness, your own kingdom, your apathy, your fear of man, be eclipsed with the beauty and the glory that fills this chapter. What could happen the next month as we study this in your own hearts to have this gospel aspirations in each and every heart? I pray that God would awaken every heart to have what we are going to see from Paul in this. And we have the same word and the same Holy Spirit. God, make us alive to the aspirations of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, it's been said that the heart of a man is revealed by his prayers because it shows what are your aspirations, what are your priorities and longings, what are the burnings of your heart? And so Paul is going to lay bare his heart and his prayer in this section. I think of Jesus in Matthew 6. Don't pray like the hypocrites. Go into the secret place and your father who sees in secret will will reward you. And that's what we're going to see with with Paul. He's going to go into the secret place and he's going to pray to my God. And he's going to see the heart uh, of man taken up in the gospel and not himself in this section. And in fact, I want to outline the section as follows. In verses 3 through 8, we're going to see Paul's praise and thanksgiving and joy for this church. And then in verses 9 through 11, we're going to see his, his petition, what he's going to pray for actually for this church. And I, I hope that we'll learn much of, about prayer as we journey this with Paul. 
So this morning, our, our first point is we want to put the fellowship of the gospel at the center of our relations with one another in verses three through eight. And as we begin, I, I just want you to put yourself in the place now of the Philippians. Can, can you imagine how the saints are feeling in, in Philippi? They, they, they know Paul has been arrested. They know he's in prison. <clears throat> they send Epaphroditus to go minister and bring a gift and to help him. And now Epaphroditus is showing up in the church and he's got a letter from Paul. And all I can imagine is the anticipation as that man stands up, if he's the one who's now going to read it. And, and so I just want to hear, how's Paul's heart? Is he downcast? He's been stuck in prison. This, this missionary journey of all that he wanted to do in spreading the gospel, he's been imprisoned. Is Paul in despair? Is he, is he afraid? Is he discouraged that the gospel is now being thwarted by his imprisonment? How is our dear brother an apostle? I, I imagine this church is on pins and needles. How is Paul? And the first thing they hear as he begins, I thank my God. It comes ringing from the dungeon in Rome. That's what fills this man's heart. Thankfulness and joy are overflowing from his prison cell. And the question is, can we have that from our prison cell, from whatever we sit in this morning? Why? What's making Paul's heart that way? I want that. So I imagine they're on the edge of their seats, and what accounts for this is what accounts for my thanksgiving and joy. When I think of my thanksgiving and joy to my shame, way too often it's my circumstances. My circumstances are what make me give thanks. My circumstances are what bring me joy. And that's not going to be anything that is driving Paul. Paul's circumstances uh, are, are not bringing that forth, but Paul had a different way of looking at circumstances. And that's my prayer for me in this church, that we learn how to look at our circumstances by faith the way that Paul is in this section. They're not, uh, they're not him deciding this is a good circumstance or this is a bad circumstance. They're always good because he has a God who's working for his good. Paul got it. There's nothing in your life right now that you determine this is good or bad that God is not using to conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. I mean nothing. In verse 6, he who began a good work in you is going to be faithful to complete it. Paul gets that and he believes that. Everything in your life is God using as an instrument to conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. Everything. And Paul could think that way. He didn't grade by, here's my circumstances. This is good. This is bad. Just, I have a God who's working for my good. And I know in everything, I can look and I can see what he's doing. Oh, for the mind of Christ, the eyes of God to see all things. Working for my good, the life of faith. It's not God is against me. Paul's not, what did I do wrong? I, took, I shouldn't have went to Macedonia. I should have kept going the other direction. Is he punishing me? That is not how Paul looks at it. And so these truths are not just to be taught and memorized in Sunday school or Bible class. They're to be understood <laughs> until you sit in your prison waiting to hear if they're going to cut your head off or not. And you open up your letter with, I give thanks. Always offering prayer with joy for you all. That should awaken us this morning. That is the work that God is finishing in each and every one of us to bring us to a place like this. And he will keep teaching us in this again and again, God, in our lives until we quit interpreting our circumstances by natural wisdom. I quit looking at my life by natural wisdom, and I see the good hand of God and the advancement of the gospel and our growth in it and bringing many sons to glory. I've got to make this shift. It's a divine shift to look at this life through the lens of God instead of the lens through what I think is right and what I think is good. You've got to make the shift. It's, it's whether your life's going to be anthropocentric or theocentric. Am I going to live always man-centered looking at my life or am I going to look at it with a God-centered perspective? <clears throat> oh, I pray that this letter would do for us what it did in Paul's heart. So if prayer is the breath of the believer, Paul had the sweetest breath 
on earth. We tend to have coffee breath. He's going to say, quit murmuring and grumbling and it just smells. Paul had the sweet breath of thanksgiving for his chains. God, let us enter in to that if wherever we sit this morning. And so this is the principal clause of the whole section. I thank my God. The Greek word for thank, it's a familiar word, eucharisteo, where we get the word eucharist. When we do the Lord's table, we, we give thanks for Christ. It's used 46 times in Pauline letters. Eucharisteo, I give thanks. Present tense, whenever you come to mind, I give thanks to God for you, Philippi's. The church is, your lives are giving Paul joy and thanksgiving. In verse four, he says, you're, I'm always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. As I'm giving thanks and praying, there's just a joy for you, saints. And I come and I thank, I can't get past this, my God. That's the key to prayer right there. We saw last week that you know you're a child of God. I thank, and some of you, it's the God. I, I thank God. I, I believe this God, he's, he's out there, he's transcendent, he's mighty. But as we just heard in a baptism, I can thank my God now. I was the best servant at church. I did everything. And now I can stand and say, he's my God. The gospel brings you in and you say, I thank my God, as the psalmist said, oh God, you are my God. I thank the living God for you, Philippians. I look at you and I see this sweet fruit that is flowing from the church. And I go right to the root and the cause of it all. I don't give you glory. I look at what God's doing and I thank God. Because nothing can happen in this church but God. And I see him doing beautiful things. Whatever graces are in this church, it's from God. Grace. Grace to you. It's God who's changing and transforming this people. So as I look out and walk with you during the week, Christ is being formed in many. The growth is sweet. The fellowship of the gospel is deep. And the unity is rich. And all I can do is give thanks to God. I give thanks to God for you. Nothing can explain what's going on in this group but God. And I want you to hear this. It's not just God. I want everyone in this room, my God. That's what grace does. When you understand the gospel of grace, that, that baptism got me. It's just, she could just, you could see it now. It's my God. It's my God. I didn't out sin grace. It's mine. This is what grace does. This is what the gospel does. My God. Too many people are in church every week trying to live the Christian life who can't say this. And this is why you can't get past go. This gospel makes it my God. And I don't want anyone to walk out of this room this morning until you can say my God. That's what the cross did. Oh God, you're my God. I thank my God and all my remembrance of you. It's used four times in this section. Every, every saint, you know, sometimes you see certain ones, I give thanks to God for you and I'm praying for you. Um, this is every saint, the whole church. I just give thanks. Whenever you come to my memory, I smile and I thank God for you in my every remembrance. What a blessed thing going on between Paul and this church. I want to be a follower of Christ like that. I want Paul to write a letter to Southside and say the same thing. I give thanks to my God and my remembrance of you. There's some letters that he wrote where he was grieved. Paul had tears. He, he put someone out from their midst. He was disturbed. You've been, Galatians, you've been so easily moved away from the gospel. But this church, my every remembrance of you, I just give thanks to God. Don't you want to be that? One observation is it's, it's everyone. There, there's something special going on here. This is not the typical American church <clears throat> where 20% of the people do 80% of the work. This is the, the whole church is engaged in gospel ministry. They're, they're, they have the fellowship 
of the gospel, every one of them. They have different gifts for sure, but they're all using what they had for the furtherance of the gospel. And so if if you're homebound, even this morning, prayer, prayer, and more prayer for the advance of the gospel as we all have these gifts that unify together. And there's a unity in joining our hearts, our hands, and our lives for this one mission. All of them are separate notes in this song to heaven, to our God. And so in Philippi, there were none who were sitting on the bench as a spectator. I want you to hear that. There were none sitting on the bench as a spectator. We've made church a spectator sport, and right here we need to repent. It is, it is everybody using their gifts, entering into the body, all one in the fellowship of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is rich. And the application is real and simple. What part are you playing in the advance of the gospel? What part are you playing? Or have you fallen into the American way where church is something you go to and leave? That does not bring Paul to give thanks and have joy. That, that actually brings grief to the minister's hearts. Not thanks. Thanks because I'm a minister for your joy. And joy is entering in to to this gospel aspiration of giving your life to its advancement. That's where you're gonna find joy. So the question is, what is it that these Philippians were doing that had Paul in such a rejoicing state before his God and giving thanks and prayer? I hope every heart say, what was it? I, I wanna do that. Come on, pastor, quit, you're going slow. So, if I were in Philippi, (laughs) hearing this letter, I think tears of joy to think that we have been such an encouragement to this good brother who's under such a trial as the Apostle Paul. What is it, Paul? I want to be that. Truly, if Paul could write us a letter, I want to be one when he remembers me. It brings joy to his heart and not a frown and discouragement. And so our outline this morning, that's a long introduction, sorry. But it, 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 will, it was working through the text. Hang it, hang it. It wasn't just all introduction. I'm, I'm making excuses. Paul is going to give us three reasons for why he's full of Eucharisteo toward the Philippian church. So now here are three reasons why his heart is giving thanks to God for this church. And I want all three of them to be in our lives. So look with me in verse five. The first one is your participation in the gospel. And he says, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now, I'm giving thanks to God. My heart's full of joy because you're participating in the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. This gospel can save. And I love that you're in fellowship with me in this gospel. The supreme passion of Paul's life is the gospel The gospel dealt with the supreme love of his life, which was Jesus. It was Christ. And the gospel glorified God, whom he loved. And so the gospel caused people to move from eternal wrath in Romans 1 under eternal life, the favor of God. It was the cry of his heart. I'm a debtor to all men. I want you to come from under the wrath of God to his love and his favor and his eternal life. I live for that. I want to preach. I'm eager to preach the gospel in Rome. It was the cry of his heart. It's taken him up, and it's what all of his days now were spent for since that day on the road to Damascus when he saw the glory of Christ. Paul has traveled 1,500 miles being beaten and shipwrecked, and nothing could stop him from preaching this gospel. It's the lens that he views all of life through. I exist for the gospel, and it's spread. I pray that God would focus that lens deeper and more in all of our hearts through the words of Paul this morning, that the gospel is my lens. It's why I exist. It's what I'm after. In his prison cell, the gospel is still foremost in his heart. And this church (laughs) labored in the gospel with him. 
And for that, he had joy and thanksgiving to God in his many prayers for them. You are participating in the glorious gospel with me. And that just floods his heart with affection. And I'll tell you, when I watch you laboring for the name of Jesus Christ, it fills my heart with so much affection. It's a joy when we all lock shields for this purpose. And I just want you to think about it. What is it that brings thanksgiving and joy to you? That'd be a good way to flip it around is this is what gave Paul joy. What, what gives you thanksgiving and joy? And, and the question is, it, it's what you love, right? So, so all your thanksgiving and joy, if, if it's, I'm just going to throw it out there, if it's the nuggets, um, that's, not, that's not it. What gives you thanksgiving and joy? It's what you love. And that is what springs emotion and gratitude like Paul has. And so the gospel is my joy and my crown. And you have the Greek word is koinonia with me in this. And so koinonia meant to share, to have fellowship, to have in common, to participate. So we're, we're just, we're sharing, we're one, we're we're, we're giving everything that we have for advancement of the gospel. So we have koinonia. We're, we're just one in, in essence in how we share this gospel. And so how have they done that? Well, Paul says you've, you've done it from the first day until now. And I want to bring you back to the introduction to the letter. The first day, Paul's on his missionary journey when he got the Macedonian vision. He comes to Philippi and there's no church. There's just pagan religion filling the city and all the debauchery that goes with it. And he goes to this little small prayer meeting and the gospel's preached. And it says that the Lord opened Lydia's heart to receive the gospel and she's saved. And she opens up her home for the early church to start meeting. And then a slave girl who's going around prophesying, Paul gets annoyed and casts it out and, and she believes the gospel. And then there's a jailer while they're in prison and this great earthquake and, and their chains break and he's ready to kill himself. And Paul says, no, we're still here. And he preaches the gospel and he and his whole household are baptized. And so it began. And, and Paul's saying, we, we united together as a church, standing against the pagan worship of our city proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. This bright light now is in Philippi. And we became one entering into this city to bring the life-giving gospel of Jesus Christ. And from day one, we joined hands in the gospel that was the power of God for salvation. We're, we're unified in it from the first day. That's how this began until now. There, there's too many who start off fast and slacken the pace in the Christian life. The newness wears off and you just become this fading light that slowly diminishes. But not this church. You haven't done that. Your passion for the gospel has not waned 10 years later. You're still laboring for its spread and its advance. This was not a church resting on its history, its past record. You remember the good old days when we used to share and people got saved? Don't keep talking about the good old days when they helped that missionary Paul. Man, we helped Paul out. We were steadfast in our labor of the gospel, no, for, for 10 years. And we know that 50 years later, they were doing the same thing with Ignatius. They never went away for this church. They never lost their first love. And this brings Paul to joy. <laughs> we are unified in the objective truth of the gospel. We Believe this gospel with all of our hearts. We're unified in it. But I want you to catch something here as well. We're unified in the subjective fruit that flows from it. And I know a lot of places, and, and I, I pray we're not one of them. And if we are, we should repent right now, is that we're only unified in the objective truth of the gospel. All we focus on is that here are the doctrines of the gospel, and if you get that, you got it all. That isn't true. Now with those truths, the subjective fruits that flow of taking this gospel and getting into lives and all of us deepening in it is, is what Paul's thanking the Lord for. You had it at first and you have it now. 
We can be unified in the truth of the gospel in Ephesians 4, but we must be unified in the spread of the gospel, the growth of the gospel in each one of us. We want to see Christ formed in each one of us to be built up into the head. We are unified in that. Are you with me? Don't miss this because many churches will unify in the doctrine of the gospel. Some won't even do that, but not the spread. Paul, uh, the enemy's happy if you do the first one and not the spread of it. We're just unified in studying it, not the preaching of it, not the sharing of it, not growing in it together as a, as a church. Learning, that, learning of it is not the end goal. It's the transforming power is the end game, that it's changing you and it's advancing and it's moving. It's not enough just to learn it. And if you're content to just learn it and have your notebooks, you've missed it. Repent. Let me take this truth and let it change me and conform me and let me give thanks and joy for the spread and the advancement of the gospel. I just want to share it, spread it, teach it. Every person in this church, whether you smile and welcome someone walking in, you're advancing the gospel if you do it from that motive. Whether you watch little babies so these young marrieds can listen and hear the gospel, it is all of us together for this one goal. I pray that you've gotten that. I've been fighting this for 25 years. We, it's, you don't get persecuted for learning the, the doctrine of the gospel. But you do when you start advancing it and living it and bringing it into the darkness. So it's a lot easier to have Bible studies and talk about it and feel like we did, it, we did our job. It isn't. That is not the end game. It's necessary. It's the first step. Let me just flush this out a little bit and I'll close out. I'm a, actually, I'm going I'm to flush it out a lot and then we'll close out. Go to Philippians 4, verse 15. I'm going to show you how this flows through this letter. <laughs> In verse 15, you yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia... No church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. You're the only church that helped me with my needs, my financial needs and prayer. You're the only church. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself. Paul, Paul couldn't even receive without thinking about others. It's not that I need to seek the gift, but I seek for the profit, which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I'm amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus, who you sent, um, a fragrant aroma and acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. So you're, you're the only church. You kept showing fruit and sharing and advancing the gospel, and you never lost heart. I was gone. You could have forgot about me. You just keep sending and helping like you do to the missionaries from this church. I praise God for what I see in you. Now go to Philippians 2.25. Paul says, I, I thought it necessary <coughs> to send to you Epaphroditus. So I'm sending him back. We'll get into more detail later. My brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need, because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you heard that he was sick. For indeed, he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him and not on him only, but also on me so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. So I've sent him all the more eagerly so that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less concerned about you. Receive him then in the the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. You sent him to come and serve me because you couldn't come and do it yourself. And so I just want you to see there in Koinonia with Paul in the spread of the gospel. I had uh, Ken Pruitt walk up to me before the service and the choir went to uh, North Denver, North Denver. I get it wrong every time, West Denver. It's either West, North, South, or East. Okay, West Denver. And what, what hit him the most 
was the unity between the two churches and how much they want to be a part and us be a part of them and all the koinonia and the sharing that's going on and the spread of the gospel. That's it. And Paul said it hasn't waned and it's very sacrificial. You're giving till it hurts for the gospel. So ask yourself this. When all the excitement and enthusiasm dies down from your initial salvation, has your heart grown cold to the spread of the gospel for believers and unbelievers? It's the gospel. It's not just emotion. It's my heart for the spread of this. The heart was not just linked to a person, but to a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul leaves and they just kept at it because it was about Christ and this gospel. In Philippians 1.29, for to you it's been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. You're suffering for the gospel. You're, you're, you're being persecuted for the name of Christ. So this was not a fleeting impulse. I want you to get this. It was a lasting principle that time will not wear off and emotions will not change. It's a set principle of this gospel. And this gospel has sustained my heart for 35 years and the embers are glowing hotter than at any time in my life. I talked with a lady recently who's been a believer around, I think, 40 years. She said, the gospel's breaking into my heart like never before. And you know what I say to that? I thank my God and all my remembrances for you that the gospel's growing and deepening and taking over the areas of your heart, your pursuits. Praise be to God. He who began a good work will be faithful to complete it. And this is amazing, this very little to knit these believers together in the physical realm. I look at this early church. You had a legalistic Pharisee, a wealthy businesswoman, a gnarly jailer, and a slave girl. That isn't usually what we send out in our church plants. It's not the making of a happy little family. But this group, with all these differences, now has Koya and Nia and the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they're one. And that has them knit with one purpose, one heart, one God, one spirit, one baptism. They are engaged in the advancing of the gospel of Jesus Christ, their joint venture. That's why Paul's giving thanks and joy for this church to have not been moved away from this purpose at any cost to God be the glory. His heart is overtaken, overwhelmed. Don't be moved away from your, your sharing together and participating in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is this church committed to putting the fellowship of the gospel at the center of our relationships with one another? They don't break when the gospel's at the center. Put the gospel at the center, not your own ambitions. Get it there. Stay there. Let nothing move you away from it. Second reason that Paul gives thanks. I got good news for you. Um, it's verse six. I think one of the greatest verses in the Bible. Let me read it. Why I'm going to give thanks is God's at work in you guys. For I'm confident of this very thing that he, God, who began a good work in you will perfect it <coughs> until the day of Christ Jesus. I give thanks because it's God who started it. It's God who's continuing it. And it's God who's going to complete it in you as you have the koinonia in this gospel. God's good work in them has put them into their own good work for the gospel. I thank God because it's him doing this and, and it will, his will to do his will and to do his good pleasure. Why you have a present tense verb is it continued for 10 years. Why, why they won't stop is that God will complete what he started. And so I want your hearts to be overwhelmed this morning, tired and weary saint. Just life gets hard. Some of you are suffering so deeply and you're troubled and you're anxious. And the God who began this work is going to finish what he started in you. You're not the one that's going to make it happen. God is. It's not your grip on him. It's his grip on you. And this is so good and rich that I'm going to spend a whole Sunday on it next week. So next week, 
Philippians 1, 6, come ready to drink up, I think, one of the best verses in the Bible. I don't want to just tap, tap it on at the end of a sermon. So next week, but I don't want you to miss the argument this morning. Why is he giving thanks and full of joy? Because God is at work in you, completing what he started. You're growing and advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you're living out the gospel more and more in verses 9 through 11 that we'll see. So come back next week for 1-6. Third reason in verses 7 through 8, because you're partakers of grace with me. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, Philippians, because I have you in my heart. Since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. It's only right for me to think this way about you. I was there when you believed upon Jesus Christ and you were baptized. But I I have watched verse 6 in your life. And I've seen and tasted of your deep love for the gospel. For me, your care, your concern, your sacrificial giving, your suffering for the name of Christ. All of you are partakers of grace with me. So we get this word koinia again. You're, You're sharing in the grace of God with me. You're tasting of the mercies and the goodness of God with me. We all are partakers of grace who have come and repented and believed in this gospel. It's taken you up. That's the confidence of Paul. So hear this. It's not, I was there when you walked an aisle. It's, I have watched what the grace of God has done in you. So it's not enough to have some little date you wrote in your Bible 30 years ago that I walked this aisle, I prayed this prayer. That's not enough. That's where it might have began. But Paul's saying this gospel has changed you and you're participating in the gospel. You're sharing, you're growing. It's it's transforming you. He's finishing the work that he began. It's caused you to spend and be spent for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, there's no turning back. You've given your life to this. You're, you're a partaker of grace with me. Grace is changing you. It's transforming you. Paul's rejoicing in that. In verse 8, it's, it's almost all emphatic. For, for God is my witness how I long for you all with this affection of Christ Jesus. Paul, there, there's not a crevice in my heart where I don't have affection for you. What, what can produce that kind of love? Who can say that? Grace cuts wide channels. There, there's, it just, you know, to the Jew, to the Gentile, to all peoples, it has wide channels, but it cuts deep ones as well. And the gospel of grace puts a love within you. Some of you have no love. There's no hope in the gospel without love. And he's just saying, you got this, this love I have, I long, I yearn, I desire. I have the affection of Christ. My heart is for you. It's Christ's heartbeat. It's Christ in me. Beats for you, church at Philippi. I want you to finish that race that he began and he's gonna work in you. And the reason is you are partakers of grace with me. I'll tell you, I can walk into an airport and meet someone I've never met before. And when I find out they're a partaker of grace with me, everyone on the airplane is like, these guys have known each other their whole life. There's an instant love with anyone who's a partaker of the grace of Jesus Christ. It's what the gospel does in a heart. The reason partakers of grace, we're all equally sinners and we're all recipients equally of the grace of God. And we have love and we have prayer and we have joy for them. And so the beauty of a church all wrapped up in the gospel and one another is is what Paul's praying here for. And I think he mentions the elders and deacons. It's the only letter he does that at the beginning. And I've gone to so many commentators and nobody gives an answer that I like. But I think it's elders and deacons, all the saints, leadership, congregants, you're all unified in one and the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it's spread. And we're together in that. In him and him alone, unmoved from our heart for Christ and his gospel is heaven on earth. 
Sometimes I wonder if I even know what love is after studying a passage like this. May God grant this to Southside Bible Church. I want to close with a couple thoughts on application and I'll let you go. First, does your labor in the gospel cause anyone to thank God in prayer? Is there anyone in your life that's watching the transformation of grace in you and they go, I thank God. I thank God for you with joy because of our participation in the gospel. Secondly, keep on working on communicating your hearts to people. No flattery in this passage. But Paul is giving thanks for them and rejoicing over them and seeing the fruits of their lives and he's expressing it. I say this all the time, don't wait for funerals to share this with one another. Thirdly, do you receive joy or jealousy when others are advancing the kingdom of God? It's a good test. If you just love the gospel of grace, I don't care who's advancing it. I don't care what church is having revival. Just want to see the gospel spread in lives and in hearts. That's your passion. Fourthly, is the fellowship of the gospel central in your relationships? Or is it that you're double income with no kids? Um, you're, you're all just married. You, you, know, you just got all these little things that bind you together that aren't the ties that, that bind is the fellowship of the gospel what is central to your relationships? Like any, anytime I hear someone think they're cooler than other people, it makes me want to throw up. And it's just in Christ, not fail or male or female, slaves, free men. It's, we're all just one in Christ. And if you've received the grace of God, we're brothers and sisters. You just, do you have that? What binds you together is that we're bound together in grace and we want to advance the gospel in each other's lives and in the unbelievers. Is that what binds, is that how you look at people? Paul says, I recognize no one according to the flesh any longer. Or do you just still bring that garbage into the body of Christ and look at people that way? I pray that it would die in the gospel, that we're all partakers of grace together. Let that melt your heart. Love for everyone that knows Jesus Christ and the ones that don't, man, do I love them and want them to have that. Partnership in the gospel. What ties us together? Our careers, our children, sports teams, food, loneliness. Those aren't excluded, but it's our passion for the gospel that brings us all together. And it's greater than race. It's greater than education. It's greater than location. If sold out for the gospel, it will hold us together. And divisions come so often when something else takes center stage besides that. Fifth, I give thanks to my God and my remembrance of you. The growing of the gospel in your hearts, the sacrificial giving for church plants and missionaries is like nothing I've ever seen. The labor to spread the gospel, I've been so blessed by choir and Christmas Eve and Easter, and you guys are doing the work of an evangelist. And Paul, Paul says, you got to excel still more. And I pray that we just keep excelling and entering into this world and meeting people that need the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then lastly, is as I look at this passage, if you've come in here and maybe you've been in church your whole life, like the testimony that we just heard, is you don't know anything about the love that we're looking at in this passage. When you're honest with yourself, your love is for yourself and how everybody else plays into it, how you can use people. I love those who receive me and you just don't know this agape love. And so you're just playing at religion. And Jesus Christ has come to set you free from the bondage of self-love and all the selfishness that comes. When you look at him hanging on a cross for your sins and God punishing him in his place, it can break self-love and it can give you a love for others that you never could have mustered up in your flesh. 
And now you can begin to say, I love all the saints. I thank God for you in my every remembrance. I love you and I care and let's have fellowship in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It breaks down all bonds. I pray for that. I pray that you would come to Jesus if you've never experienced that kind of freedom. So let's go to our Lord and just pray. God, I thank you for this passage. I pray that our hearts would be so unified and one in lifting up the one who died in our place on a cross, who was the Son of God, who was buried and raised on the third day and now intercedes at your right hand and is coming again to establish an eternal kingdom. God, I thank you for this gospel. And I pray that it would break down lesser things for sitting with a husband and wife this morning with a division, a brother and sister in the blood or in Christ, with a division when this gospel is to unify us and make us one with our sins and weaknesses as we journey to glory and we help each other. God, let us be set on this one thing. Let the center of, of our fellowship be the desire for the gospel to be built into each one of us and taken to the world, the nations. God, let that take up every heart. If it's grown cold this morning, would you light that fire again in us? That Paul wouldn't have to say, you guys started out really well and you lost your fervor for the gospel. You lost its advance. You lost it in each other. God, I pray that that would be what binds us together. God, I pray for any who walked in here that don't know Jesus Christ. Don't let them go out of here without him. Let them repent, fall at his feet for their sin, cry upon him for his work, his, his cross that could wash away their sins even this morning as far as the east is from the west. God, grant them the gift of faith. Let them look up from themselves and look to Christ alone for their salvation. God, set them free from their bondage. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.